All this data that we're now generating out in the world, why is it that everybody's using this data except us? Every time there's a new technology, uh, there's always danger involved in it. I'm very concerned that the people that are spending most of the time right now speaking and focusing and thinking about big data are large companies and governments. And that's fine, but this is gonna affect our lives, our parents, our kids, and I think we should all be involved in this conversation right now. I'll, I'll give you one example why. Um, somebody told me last week that there are banks that when you apply for a loan, um, if they try to look at your Facebook page, if you haven't you know, cloaked it, and if you listen to rap music, they will lower your rating score. But there are people making decisions, writing algorithms, putting laws, sort of software laws in place that with no regulation and no oversight, and this is some well-meaning programmer who thought, oh, I'm gonna protect my bank, but you don't even know this happened. So all, these, all this data that we're now generating out in the world, why is it that everybody's using this data except us? There's an example in my book, Human Face of Big Data, of a, a gentleman who has a, a wireless pacemaker. So throughout the day, his pacemaker transmits his data to his doctor. So he decided that he would um, measure his exercise, his sleep, his alcohol consumption, and then see if he could map it against when his pacemaker kicked in. So he called the manufacturer and said, could I have a copy of the data you've been collecting about my heart for the last six months because I want to see if any of my behavior affects it. And they said, sorry, sir, this, this is our proprietary data. He said, wait, wait a second, this is my heart. You've been collecting data about my heart. And they, they're refusing to give it to him. So that's an interesting story about him in particular, but it kind of speaks to this larger issue of who does own our data, who's benefiting from it, who's trading in it, and why do we have no say, one, over who gets it, and shouldn't we benefit it? And maybe, maybe if I got 10% of Google's selling my browser history, I'd be happy about it. But it, it seems like this conversation is not happening amongst us, and I think it needs to be. I worry about the fact that in, in some countries in the world, hopefully not our country, uh, imagine if, um, imagine what a boom, a boon to, um, to a country like China, where people are now planting trackers on themselves, where the government knows where you've been, who you've talked to, what you've read, what you spent money on. You think about it, if eight years ago someone said, could I, could I plant a tracker on you so I'd have all this information? You'd say, no way, and now we spend you know, people sleep in line for the privilege of buying these trackers to plant on themselves. We do it because it's convenient, but what are we trading on the other side? I don't have any answers to this. I was lucky enough to go out and talk to a lot of people, DJ Patil and Tim O'Reilly and Juan Enriquez and Esther Dyson, all these really interesting thinkers in this space, and asked each of them to tell us the good side and the bad side. Esther Dyson talks about the fact that we're now seeding the world with these almost completely free sensors that are now starting to talk to each other and change their behavior based on each other. So we're not the center of the data conversation anymore. You know, it's like Skynet. A lot of this is, has the potential to solve all of humanity's problems or create a whole other set. I think that all we need is really one terrible example of the abuse of all this information and things will go backwards really fast. And that's why we did this Human Face of Big Data project. I think we all need to be talking about this right now and not just letting it happen in the background and think, oh, we'll, we'll figure this out later. Hi, I'm Rick Smolin. Please subscribe to Thinker.